and also performed quite well. Um, so this is basically look at a, uh, the prediction problem, graphic filtering from a different <coughs> perspective. So think about this, uh, we have a huge user item matrix, right? What we can do is that let's do it here as not. If we have M number of users and M number of uh, um, items, this huge matrix. What we can do is that we can decouple it into three metrics, where different matrices, the three different metrics have a different uh, structure, if you like. The U matrix and V matrix, they are orthogonal. So what I, when I say orthogonal, is basically say this uh, uh, color vector, the divided by together, it's a one if they are the same color vector. If it's a different, if a different color, color then um, multiply the um, will be zero. So that means you could, when you have the matrix transform uh, multiply together, you will get a, a, a density, density uh, matrix. Um, and also the interesting thing is the sigma, sigma matrix, which is diagonal uh, matrix. So this is a, uh, it's a mathematical tool to help you to decompose this uh, huge matrix. And this is how it looks like. You got this R matrix and you have this decomposition. And it's really, you can treat it really as a black box. And there are many, many, many codes. For example, you can use MATLAB, it has one line code. You have the matrix that you get this uh, decomposition. Value. And the nice thing of, okay, let us see some of the property of it. So the, the sigma, in fact, called a singular value of R, the sigma here. Um, <coughs> And then this, uh, if the R matrix is a singular, so when I say singular, it's that uh, it's determinant is is zero. And uh, then there, there are some of the, the data here is zero. And in general, the rank uh, is number of non zero signal that we would like, uh, we would like to have. And the SVD is, is mostly unique, so whatever technique you use is mostly unique. However, it's my, you know, some of the sigma might be identical, uh, but the same. Uh, so this is basically the property of the SVD. So what we can do here in collaborative future is say, instead of using some you know, s standard technique to do the SVD, what we can do is that, because what we are preferred is to make prediction. We will want to re recover some of, the, some of the missing data. So what we need what we said, we want to have the decomposition. And that help us to approximate the original metric such that we can dis recover these missing data. So in other words, what we really want is original matrix, and this is our decom decomposite matrix. And we want the, the difference between them all the errors between the, in this case, the squared error, uh, would be as small as possible. So therefore, we want to find this matrix in such a way that would be minimize um, the object function, the errors that we find. So this error function, think about this, is quite similar to uh, squared error, uh, root squared error we were talking about, measurement. So it's another way to directly optimize your object function, one of your object functions. Um, so in convention, that what we do is that we don't have three metrics, but combine the first two together. Therefore, you have the original matrix and the decoupled into two metrics. So this W matrix is, in fact, the U multiplied by sigma. This is what kind of use it, use it, use it, uh, happens in the, in the practice. We decoupled into two metrics as opposed to three. Um, and then, and that's it. And so here is the example how it works. Uh, okay, one thing I forgot to mention is that you can actually reduce the dimension here to whatever dimension you wanna you wanna achieve, such that to reduce your competition. Obviously, that that's because of the reduce that. Therefore, you get essence of this metric. Therefore, you can pro approximate and to predict the missing data. To give you an example. Suppose this is original data. And we decompose it to, into two matrix where uh, the item matrix 
which is the, the, the W matrix that we talked about, and the user matrix, which is the, uh, the U matrix that we, we were talking about. Uh, the, what you can do is, um, I'm not going to do using all the, all the dimensions, but using the uh, three dimensions. Equally for user, I'm using dimensions. So it's like you have, suppose you have a missing data. That missing data can be predicted by looking at item vector or this uh, color vector, which represent uh, sorry row vector, which represent the uh, features for this item, and then user color vector will represent the feature of user, and you make a dot product between these two features, you would get prediction for you will get a prediction for for this particular missing data. Does it make sense? Any question? No. Okay, so so this is the way you can approximate the original matrix and try to make a prediction. Uh, so in that sense, sometimes it's not, it not really, what I will show later, it's not really <coughs> SD anymore it's because the optimization function, uh, method is quite different, but it's co and the spirit is in fact the same. Um, but it does have many, many issues. For example, you may already know, because it's a very sparse matrix, therefore some of them are missing. Uh, so if you do the SVD uh, calculation, it's not, because some of the entries are not known, therefore whatever you establish is not really, uh, uh, can, it's not really represent the, uh, the original matrix. But there are uh, some techniques, for example, if you have SVD, which can handle the missing data. So that's the, if you look at this, the, the paper that uh, Put here. So this is a technique that can, you might want to make use of if you want to handle missing data. And also it's fairly easy to overfit because the data is really sparse and need to some regularization. Um, so what happens is that if you look at this uh, mathematically, uh, people formulate the problem by looking at different perspectives. Saying, okay, I got a huge matrix. I factorize into two uh, vectors or two matrix. And then for each element in the original matrix, and I would have a two vectors. I have a dot product between it. One is the user vector, another is the item vector. I have a dot product between them. And then I will get my uh, prediction. And then, so this will become your model, right? You want, to, you want to know the value of P and not the value of Q. And this is your prediction, or this is your ground truth. And this is the, the, the data you, you have. So it's become, in the training process, is that you want to minimize this squared error in such a way, you want to minimize that in order to get the optimal parameter. In this case, A is a user vector and item vector. The question is, how? what would be the best way to minimize the square error? So there, again, there are quite a number of ways. One, one way you can, can look at the problem is that, think about this, it's quite similar to linear regression, if you know uh, linear regression is. And so what you have is that you can keep one of the parameter fixed. So let's say if you fixed PU and then try to obtain QI by using so-called least uh, least square method. So for people not really familiar with uh, least square uh, method of a linear function, uh, I have the wiki. If you start with the wiki, so normally I don't suggest you look at the Wikipedia uh, because you know sometimes it's not really the, the material there is not really. Clear. Correct. Not really correct. But it's something you could start with. It's always something you could start with. You can go through the Wikipedia 
make sense of you know what do I mean by least square, what do I mean by linear function, and uh, uh, look at some of the reference. The, the, the reference unit is quite good. And look at it, and then you can you probably know okay if just to solve a link, link, uh, least square um, linear function, if you are able to solve the linear function, and then you can see that if you fix one of the parameters and in fact, it's a uh, linear regression problem. Therefore, you've been able to apply the least square approach to, to address it. So anyway, so you can fix the one, uh, learn another one. And once you can fix another one, learn P, PU. So you can do this um, iteratively. Therefore, you will get your solution. So this is the one, one way to do that. Um, Another way is called stochastic gradient descendant. Um, so this is more, uh, more or less uh, unlinear. So when I say unlinear is that you can throw a training data, throw a, a, a into your training procedure without to retrain the whole thing. So you have this current P and Q. And you have additional training data coming in. You can update your P and U according. So you don't need to start uh, to restart everything uh, again. So this is because of the simplicity of that, it's quite uh, commonly used. So what you can have is that you have this uh, uh, object function you want to minimize. And then you, for each time step, you have a training and particular rating comes in particular rating for user 1 and for user i to, to user 2. Sorry, particular rating for uh, user i to item j. Uh, then you would like to have is that you could update the PU for this particular user. That's this particular user. You got this particular additional rating called D. You could update the PU and also update um, uh, QI. I think there's a type of here. This should be QI. So therefore, you can update QI for this item. You can also update um, PU for this particular user. So then you iteratively do this, uh, secretly do the updating, and uh, you will get your uh, final uh, So in the beginning, is that you can set up random P, U, and Q, 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 I in the beginning, then do this update, eventually you set up the st stopping criteria, and then you do that. So this is a nice, it's, in fact, it's quite a ni nice, interesting story about Netflix competition. Um, so this guy, Simon, uh, I'm not sure, it's, it might be Australia. So this guy, um, in the early stage of Netflix competition, and uh, he, is, he was the one uh, tried this technique, and eventually he put this source code online, and let other people uh, do that. And then other, in fact, all the other people follow this and uh, using this technique. It's worked quite well to to able to handle the large uh, large scoring because less this data is compared to the previous uh, movie uh, rating data is uh, one of one of the is is very big, very large. Therefore, it's very hard to train. But using this tech is fairly easy. So I would consider this kind of really the hero of the behind this technical competition. Um, and would you say the results are pretty similar each time, depending on the Well the result really depends on mm -hmm. how so it's a, it's, a, it's still a tricky in terms of how you try properly train that. Sometimes if you don't train it very well and you think a good way, then it's the result wouldn't wouldn't be quite good. So it's again there's a one parameter here, which I haven't mentioned. This is a step function. You want to think about what is a good step function. And what are the users you put it, put in first? What are the users? You want to read it first. What are the users you go first? Uh, again, this is a, 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 there's a online code. You can find the code online. So you can try to use it to see whether it works in, in your case. Um, but the underlying mathematical is they never mentioned the score cast gradient descendant, but it, it, it indeed is the score cast gradient descendant. Um, so um, we talk about this uh, 
the interaction between use and item, right? Dot product. But the, the complete model would be um, add some bias, if you like. So it's quite similar to user-based database when we talk about uh, offset. So in this case, a prediction is consists of the called mu, which is a global average. And then it's an average, a BU is average from user, and the BI is average from item. So it's like offset of user, offset of I um, item, and offset, global offset. Once you got these three, and then you have this called user item interaction. That's the, that's the place you do personalization. So put them together, what you actually have is that you have the prediction, this is your model, right? This is your parameter. And you want to minimize the error in your data such that you will get optimal parameter, which is those, uh, those values. And here is regularization. So uh, I said that it's really tricky to um, have a, a good, um, you know, good optimization uh, in the end. So the regularization is a, is a technique that help you uh, to reduce the overfit, overfitting problem. So that when I say overfitting problem is that you have a training. Although the training is, uh, the error is very small when you minimize, but when, when you apply it to unknown items, unknown users, it's in fact the perform, uh, the perform doesn't really perform well. It's because you overfit to the training data has gone. By doing this regularization, in fact, would help you, help, help you sort of uh, get rid of this uh, overfitting issue. Can you see if you've got this problem by um, checking among the same users the predictions, or do you have to redo the whole thing on a new set of users? So um, how do you see? How do you know if you've got this problem? If it's okay, training? so you can you can uh, you can split this into training and test, and you can draw this uh, training and test in. Sorry, uh, the same users are they both the training and test. So so let's time? say you have this huge matrix, right? You have a huge, and they can randomly split the data into training users and the test users. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So you can always test the performance mm -hmm. here in the training user and chat room in the test user. Yeah. And, and both, both of those sets are also partitioned to more um, partitions, one of future. Yeah. And, and one is, is ground, ground truth, which you can see that that's, that's something that you, yeah. you need to have it ask user to read some movies in order to make predictions. So you, again, in the test set, you have this uh, called uh, ratings, you put it as a profile, and the ratings that you want to predict Sorry. Um, any any other question? Okay, so um, so this is a I think this is one of these uh, most uh, successful uh, algorithms. Well, this quite simple. One of the most successful algorithms uh, in Netflix competition. So it turned out quite 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 good. Um, so let, let's give insight how, how, how it works. Let's say you have this baseline prediction. We get, we're just talking about bias. Uh, suppose that you have in the entire data set, the mean rating is 3.7. And this, um, you, could, you could easily get that by averaging all the ratings. And then if you know nothing about this, this perhaps is your best guess. Now I say I want to you know the rating of the six sets, and you can you can say okay I might be able to use the bias for this particular movie. So this particular bias is 0 0.5 stars above the average. Therefore, say if when I give you say I want to have a guess of this particular movie, the heavy prediction would be the mu plus the bu, so mean average ratings plus the bias from the, the six steps. And then we're going to talk about it again. Okay. I want to make prediction uh, about Joan rate this movie. If you have additional information, you know that the Joan's rate is in general 
higher, a bit higher than the, a bit lower than the average limit. Perhaps you might minus 0.2. That becomes your, uh, you know, best guess. So in the, in the end, you would have, you know, for example, in this case, you would predict four stars. But this is not really personalized. Uh, or it somehow is a bit personal, but it's not really talk about interaction between user IT until you are using the uh, the dot product UI uh, PU and QR. So uh, by using this, you can actually adjust your prediction. Remember, we have this prediction for the three uh, values. We predict the four, and then. That interaction tell you that perhaps you should add, uh, adjust it uh, a little bit, then become your estimation. So this is sort of uh, uh, you know why this uh, uh, how you know this uh, the prediction is is consist of non personalized plus the personalized together and. Uh, And now, now, now let really me talk about elastic uh, competition. So it's started in 2006. It's uh, a million dollar challenge, right? If you get a child, you want to improve that uh, accuracy 10%, you, you might get a one million dollar. If you a guy, a group, uh, you eventually uh, win the competition, got a million dollar. Unfortunately, these Netflix never implement that due to various reasons. But I think that it's, it's win-win, it's indeed, even though it didn't have a really it's a win-win uh, situation because from the advertising perspective, right? So the million, even a million dollar is, uh, is worth it. Uh, but a nice thing for the scientific perspective, it's very interesting data set for us because remember, what we, when we do collaborative filtering, when I was a PhD student, I, I worked on collaborative filtering. Um, we're working on movie related data, which is uh, about 1,000 1, users. That's it. So here, think about this: about four, um, about 500,000 users. So whatever I develop, I have to put work in the in the Netflix uh, competition. You see, so you, you probably need to code, uh, you need to change the methodology of your, your your scientific stuff. So anyway, so this is a very interesting data, and also the money, right? Therefore, many people uh, join join the uh, the competition and um, try to figure out what was the best one. It turns out, you know, many people using exactly the same techniques as a guy published online. Uh, this uh, factorized uh, approach and using score cast gradient descendant. Some people don't even understand what's going on there. You know, trying to turn the parameter. So I mean, it's really really um, difficult because you need to vary, even though the same technique, different people coding it might complete, have a completely different um, result. It's indeed how you carefully tune the parameter. That's very crucial. And so the two popular ones, max, max factorization and the neighborhood. So neighborhood one is the one we, it's quite similar to what we talk about, user the other database. And the uh, max metric is exactly what we, we talk about. Um, so this is basically the training data. So you got this instead of this huge matrix here is that you have the presentation is like you have user ID, movie ID, a date, and a score. So um, I can't remember that they provide the link of the movies. I can't remember, but I think some people using content is good for that. But anyway. It's, it seems like it's not really possible for you to recover who who is, is a guy like that. But you know, some guy did, some people working on security, privacy, they actually find out, okay, for the data, they identify this user might be the user in the Netflix uh, user. But this is another you know, story, people working on security, they really want to work on that. Um, and this is, um, the um, performance table, if you like. So if you look at um, working on, uh, just do the average. Uh, I'm averaging, I'm using my global average 
to make prediction. And this 1.1293 was the was the root, root uh, square error. This is root square error. Average root, root square error that you can actually get. But if you're using user average, and you obviously can reduce your error. And using movie average, you reduce your error further. And this ceiling match is basically the baseline algorithm uh, Netflix was was used. Uh, uh, that's, that's Netflix used. So they basically said if you can improve that um, uh, that value by ten percent, you know I will give you a minimum. Mm -hmm. And then the people apply the static neighborhood approach. It's already improved that dramatically. I have no idea what they are doing there, but. You know, people who started this uh, competition, even using very simple static neighborhood method, the one that I will talk about, right? The user being the already got this uh, quite a good improvement. And then using the factorized methods that we talk about, metric factorizing was improved further. The interesting thing is that after that, not, not really many people were able to improve a lot. And the guy, you know, discovered that the effect has some time effect in the data. Not necessarily user behavior, but it's some adjustment in the data. And if you spot that um, effect, um, improve your algorithm based on that, you can actually improve uh, you know, a bit. Um, and you can consider this uh, coming with dynamic approach, like dynamic neighborhood, and adding some dynamics in the factorization. So in the end, the grand prize uh, was that you planned it over hundreds of magazines that you might have the 10% improvement. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm not sure what would be the latest uh, performance uh, in terms of uh, moving square, but you know, it's, uh, it's just still going on. So, uh, so what, what I, when I say the temporal effect, Tom effect, is that a strange thing happens early in 2004 in the data. And some people plot, if you just plot the average rating over time, you will find that at per certain day, the early uh, 2004, the average rating suddenly goes up. So if you don't really look at the data globally, you probably wouldn't be able to find out that. And there, therefore, you wouldn't be able to prove provide a, a good uh, sort of prediction. But if you think about this, if you have that graph, what are you going to do? What would, you, what would be the, your adjustment? Let's say you start with user-based approach. And now you observe that uh, the data, if you look at the term, it's uh, the V suddenly goes up. What would, would would be your solution? Subtract the mean. Sorry? Subtract the mean. Subtract the mean. Subtract the mean. So you basically we have two means. Uh, if it's my predictions here, I'm going to use the mean here, right? Uh, it's my predictions here, I'm going to use the mean over here. Yeah, if you use the two means, depending on time, perhaps you would have a better, better uh, prediction. So that's, that's the sort of things that give you idea that perhaps the, you need to take into account the temporal behavior of the user. And also, if you look at this, uh, for a single movie, and uh, this is an averaging um, score that you get from the, uh, from the users, uh, this is the, this, um, uh, the term that when the movie released to Netflix and they keep going, over time, when people start to read that movie when they release in the Netflix. You find there's, and the people tend to uh, give a higher rating, you know, uh, as time goes by. So that's the something perhaps you need to take into account as well. And so, it, to summary, there's uh, quite different temporal dynamics. For example, for the item size, that's. Uh, you know, this is more more or less from the item side that the items, um, you know, as time goes by, have a better better 
ratios, as higher ratios. And so this, and also the seasonal patterns that, for example, this you could consider as a seasonal pattern. Okay. I guess it's something might be the you know, Netflix changing user interface or change this uh, scheme for, for, for the ratings, therefore you might have the big jump. So uh, you might also have some tempered dynamics from a user perspective, right? It's really, when I said, the user, user's taste sometimes is not really stable and uh, you might keep changing over time. So you might want to take that into account they have this uh, taste drift, and uh, so these are the things perhaps you need to take into account. Um, so what we can do is that, let's say in this basic um, matrix factorization method, you can you can say, okay, this parameter is, is time dependent. You can say that this the parameter about this user is time dependent. The parameter about item is time dependent, and you also have these. Um, well, this also is, is uh, something to do with the user. So the users is indeed they are, they have this temporal. Uh, <coughs> the taste ch keep changing uh, over time. So you can using this uh, the factorization model and add some additional bit and then make this parameter time dependent. Therefore, you will be able to. Uh, deal with that. Uh, so once you have that, you could able to because in the in the Netflix data, you not only have this uh, uh, rating, but also tell you when the user give the rating. Therefore, you could able to train based on T. For different T, you will have a different uh, you know user offset uh, item offset. So you could. Make use of this uh, time step in the training data to be able to learn your model. Uh, equally, um, there also have methods can, can be used for labelhood uh, collaborative tutoring approach. So, uh, so the your question about you, you ask the question about is whether it's labelhood. Right? So, in fact, the one we talk about is quite you can you can represent in. In that similarity graph. Let's say these are the uh, uh, graph uh, of items, let's say, and based on similarity. Therefore, you can look at the other similar um, items and make prediction. So, this is a um, this is formula based on that. So, instead of say, I calculate the WIJ, in fact, the rate, we make a prediction for the similar for the labor. This is your similarity. So instead of saying we calculate similarity by looking at pixel correlation or cosine effect, can we learn that similarity from the data? So that's the way uh, the label put modeling is about. Is that we can use we can still same framework, and this is our model. Right? This is RUI is my prediction, and the parameter here is a WIT. The similarity, the similarity score. So, what can I can do is that I can learn the W and based on the squared error that I can get from the training data. So, this is the way, this is the alternative way to uh, conduct a user based or item based <coughs> level filtering. Instead of coming with your similarity directly, we could. Um, learn the similarity by using the training data. And the nice thing of this is that we naturally embed into an additional bit taking to take into account uh, term, term dependency, uh, taking into account that when the rating uh, is given. Any question about that? Okay, so once you do that, you can find that it can improve the look at the static label group and the dynamic label group. You can see that it's have quite big jump in terms of uh, performance improvement. Um, any question about Netflix competition? Yeah, uh, I know you kind of 
yeah, taking into account um, time dynamics. Is there any way to take into account uh, sequential dynamics, if that makes sense? Uh, just like the fact they would watch that. Yeah, the sequence in which people would watch things. OK, so yeah. This really depends on what, what is your condition, right? So can you give me an example? What would be the? I mean, with the Netflix data, is there any way to take into account that someone watched the comedy, just watched the comedy, and before that they watched a horror? Yeah, so because with, with these models, you're kind of assuming you're not taking into account what order they watch things in, or the actual date of when they watch things. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's very interesting. Right? So you might want to, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's possible. So definitely. So you, when you have a prediction for this guy read this item, you're gonna look at what other ratings this guy had in the in the apps yesterday, right? A condition of that so would be make prediction. Yeah, I think that's possible. Uh, yeah, I'm more even. I don't want that really. Like just because that's still assuming that all the other programs. Kind of almost at once, you're not even really taking into account which one happened before the last, if that makes sense. Like it went, I don't know, is there no signal in that, would you say? Uh, well, I say it's possible. You can, you can, uh, you can derive, a, even you can apply these basic ones to take that into account. Right? It's, it's all about future representation. You can present that particular item, I say, a particular context uh, by right, feature you come up with. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, bear in mind, this is very basic, uh, yeah, yeah. basic uh, techniques, so Sorry. you can add, you know, obviously expand it and to address this some specific problem that you have to deal with. Right. Any, any other question? Any question about, you know, the computer book analysis? Any idea? Or any, any comments or any other raise? Okay. Uh, so we we focus now. We focus here is really so far. We focus on this uh, actress. Right? So as uh, we talk about we talk about error. We talk about precision. We talk about recall. We talk about recommendation. Top ten recommendation to see how it is. Uh, but there are number of issues. There are number. Of, there are quite a number of uh, other problems equally important. Um, for example, COSAR problem. Um, so what if this guy is a new user? Come just come to the system, just come just uh, came to Netflix, let's say. Are we able to make personalized recommendation? Can we do that? Somebody say what if we ask you to do that? Are you able to find a method for that? Get their IP address if you found their location. A little bit of effort, that's it. Sorry? Get their IP address if you find their location. I would suggest uh, maybe you can pop up a few posters, which one they have then to click on. Then choose six. At least we know what kind of genre they like. And then get some good data. So it's more like questionnaire. Uh, we ask uh, the user to Fill in some questionnaire. Yeah, yeah, but it's still questions we take on the process. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's that's one um, one possibility. And there's other issue like called new item code star. So if the item is new, let's say the movie just released, nobody really read it yet. Can you make a recommendation? Can you send this? Do you know what who? Who would be interested in that, that movie? So, can you do that? Or the conventional collaborative would work, right? Uh, any idea how to sort of make a suggestion about, about the new movies, let's say? Well, it depends on how much data you have about the movie and about other movies. You could you try might, and yeah. We can try and establish uh, relationships between movies based on participation of the production team, of 
and there are similar actors, similar director, producer, and so on. So if you look at these contents, essentially function based, which are feature based. So yes. that, that's one way, yes. But you know, sometimes it's very difficult to predict. Is it? Some, some uh, director have these blockbuster movies, but sometimes it also make, make the visibly film some of the movies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really hard to predict. Um, not sure. And what, uh, as we talk, we will talk about the prediction market and in the web economics um, course. So one of the interesting idea is um, build this um, <coughs> build a prediction market for movie industry. So before the movie launch, you somehow buy futures or of the movie. Say, I'm going to predict they're going to have you know, how much revenue the you know, many people like or you know, it's really a uh, crap movie. And then there's some futures market. Look at it, how people perceived. So it's like stock, uh, stock market, but not for the real stock, but for the movie. movie. So that's the way you can gather the statistics for the users. Uh, so, so I mean, <coughs> in short, so it's a cold star problem. It's indeed it's very difficult for uh, for planet usually. And actually, people had a study about using content description, and it's, uh, it's not really as good as using uh, ratings. Um, so <coughs> perhaps what we can do is that we quite extensive initial interaction. We definitely need to uh, ask the user feedback, perhaps. And uh, but the question is, uh, we are we have to make it very short. So to mean that we're not going to ask the user great hundred movies, but you know we're going to ask very limited number of you, you know, movies. And the question is now here is that if I okay allow you to ask this new user three questions or three give them three movies to rate. What type of items that would be would it be good? What type of item that would be for us to easily understand this user's uh, uh, taste? So this is an example. Let's say you you got this uh, whole interest space, whole universal interest space where you have three, four type of users. When the new user comes in, then it might be say, okay, uh, you want to find this, uh, you want to say which genre you want to ask. Do you like romantic movies? Do you like drama movies? That if you ask that question, whether I would be best know this particular user. So. The code star problem, one of the solutions obviously, is really trying to minimize effort to understand user taste. Right? Uh, so if we want to ask users to rate movies each by each, like you said, right? Uh, so which movie do you show the new user? Which which movie should should we should definitely show the user? So that if you know that you read him, you definitely know his taste. So this is basically the, and in, this is basically in this research field called questionnaire design or active learning. And so one, okay, let, let's say, what would be the best way for for you to choose? Do you have any hint? <coughs> if I only allow to ask one movie, <coughs> what would, would the movie you're gonna choose to ask? In order to best understand the user's taste, <coughs> I have de two decisions here. <coughs> I'm gonna select a movie randomly. The second one, I'm gonna select the most frequently rated movies. Do you think which method would be the would be better? Second. Okay. Sorry? Popular movies. Why? 
popular movies aren't very discriminating in the sense that if most people like it, then they're probably just going to say they like it. You know, not much more about them at that point. Therefore, it's not really good. Yeah. But you said it's uh, good. Yeah, no, I, say it's good. I say it's good. Why? Because uh, if you go to watch a movie, assuming you're going to cinema, you don't go alone. So most likely, somebody else is going to influence the choice. So the popular choice is the influencer of going to watch the movie. But however, if you you, 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 you almost like already know this guy's taste for the most uh, written movie because uh, let's say not read. Why I bother to ask you because I probably already know you. You ninety percent gonna like it. So it's uh, it's some effort. I have asked you to make effort, but the information that I get from this action is in fact not really too much. Therefore, perhaps it's a random one would be better, isn't it? But if you choose a random movie, uh, it will be high probability that you don't know this movie actually. Okay, yeah, I think here has, has, a, has one or uh, something you said, you probably say, okay, uh, if I ask you, definitely no. But, yeah, I mean, that you're right. If you say there is a chance you just don't know, perhaps, yeah, we, we need to consider yeah, that uh, another, another approach. The yeah. solution I was going to try to implement. Um, was, uh, well, it depends on which method for a single value decomposition. I was going to try and find the clustering of the, um, on the content space and then find archetypes, mm -hmm. programs, and then that, just a, a kind of collection of, um, of pieces of content which cover the space yeah. kind of in an archetype kind of sense and then ask them to be rated. So you basically say, okay, now I have a, a population of uh, items. And then I uh, classify them into, let's say, yeah, four yeah, categories. Yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe I will ask the four questions. Therefore, yeah, uh, yeah. that's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Right? Yeah. So anyway, so it's a, uh, it's a non-trivial question. So it's a, uh, perhaps you know, you know, random design is better than the popularity based. Perhaps uh, you, uh, you may not, you may, you may not true. So it's really. Um, really depends on the criteria you're choosing. So one um, approach, you know, active learning is that I'm gonna choose one of criteria here because then can come in with all kind of criteria. Uh, one of them is okay. I'm gonna choose most uncertain item given my current prediction model and this method. So, so here it it means that I have my understanding of this user's taste at the moment. And this is based on my current prediction from my model. For example, I might have a, a little bit of ratings or a little bit of uh, information about this guy. Well, I might have nothing, I have no idea about this guy's taste. But this is my general prediction about a random guy the his waiting for movie A would follow this distribution. Uh, if a random guy that uh, if one rate movie B, they will follow this distribution. So they are very likely they're gonna rate five, four. They're very likely they're gonna rank uh, three. With different confidence. If you like this I'm uh, being as confident with my prediction, there is uh, here I'm not really sure. Um, okay, so what I really want is that perhaps I want to select item that is least competent, competently predicted. So, in other words, which one I'm least competently predicted at the moment? Sorry? Least competent. Yeah, least competent predicted. The second one. So this one because it has a large. Not various, yeah. So this formula basically gives that. Okay, I have. I'm gonna look at this. The predictions. I'm looking at. See, the prediction has a, a very uh, the least confident, least let's say in other words, least smallest probability being that way. If I ask this guy, uh, the you can pick up the one, and then. Get rid of Perhaps so that's the one the approach I can come with. So what's the drawback of this? Give 
that let's say what would be the consequence from there. So let's say we only have <coughs> you are allowed to choose movie A, the not a ring. Allowed to choose movie B, uh, David Lynch, like Lost Highway. It's a uh, horror movie, right? No, it's Sweden. Sweden. Never know? Yes. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> It's a David Lynch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always dread. <laughs> always something to understand. But anyway, so if you look at this, <coughs> perhaps based on the formula we, we calculate, if you look at this mode, the peak one, this 44% of user in fact like a lot of rings. So my prediction on this guy would be a random guy comes in, or would be 40, 44%. 44.7%, I would be uh, mid right, right? If I predict they're gonna, they're gonna like, they're gonna like only 22% chance are mid right. So that suggests that because this my, my prediction will be lower, my, sorry, my confidence of my prediction will be lower with this guy. Therefore, based on this criteria, I should choose this to ask the user to win. If I know this guy's waiting for Kazan, uh, at least for this particular movie, I have improved my confidence. But there's drawback of this approach. Any idea? Well, in the end, the, the reason why we're presenting them with the choice is we want to learn about the user. We don't necessarily want to learn about the movie. At the moment, we are gathering more information about the movie. Yes, that's correct. So, it's, so this is the criteria. It's only say, are we going to select the most uncertain item? I'm often asking user give rating. Then that's, that's it, right? So we know the user is reading about this movie. And that's it. We're not really improved, not really improved our understanding. Might improve, but not, not essentially improve our understanding about the user's taste. We understand the user's taste for this movie, but in the general taste, this criteria doesn't really uh, say. So there's uh, another uh, criteria. So, so the first criteria that the this uh, select the most uncertain ones. You can think about this. I'm gonna maximize my maximize. First, I do the maximize. Choose the one that I'm that that is my prediction, and I want to minimize the value. Therefore, pick up this one. So it's, uh, in general, it's called mini-max strategy. So in this mini-max strategy, um, it's not, as I said, it does not necessarily reduce uncertainty of, uh, of, of our taste model or recommendation model. Right? <coughs> it's not necessarily reduce that maximally. So what we, the second criteria, or second approach say, I'm going to select most informative item. We will talk about how to define informative. We're going to select the most informative item in order to max, maximally reduce the uncertainty of our model, our, our recommendation prediction model. So when I say recommendation model, it's indeed it's, uh, you can think about the to reduce the uncertainty of our model parameters. Uh, so again, in order to do that, we need to have a proper measure. In terms of measures and uncertainty, how, what do I mean by informative? How can we measure the uncertainty of the model? Right? We definitely need to think about this. So then we have to borrow the idea from uh, s signal processing, from, from information theory. That uh, I think I briefly mentioned the entropy when we talk about language model. Idea. Um, anyway, so entropy is a is a measure is a measure of you, you certainly my my uh, came across this already. So the measure of information in in a random event really measure how much information is embedded in, uh, into a random event. Let's say you have a ran random variable x. So the x have the possible outcome from x one to x n. You're not really sure about it. But you do have some information about it. Some information about it can be sort of 
represented as a probability. So you have a probability, belief about how likely a certain event is going to happen. And the entropy is basically based on the probability estimation. Probability, you would calculate the entropy, which indicates how much information embedded in that random event. So when, let's say, the entropy of event is zero, then the outcome is already known. So that means you have pretty sure about the outcome, therefore the entropy is zero. There's not too many information there. So here example, if I have, uh, say, you have a random event, X, which which have two possible outcomes. Just like flip, flip the coin, right? You have a possible income of zero, a possible income of one. And when you have, say, you're not really sure about, you have no information about that, say the best guess is that the, the probability of um, zero is, is 0 0.5, probability of one is 0 0.5. And then, that entropy, in fact, when the probability is 0 0.5, if you look at entropy, is 1. So that means you have, and the entropy is basically the maximum entropy you would have. Because you represent that you're not really sure you, about this particular event. And when, if you look at this, the probability is 0 or probability is 1, and then this entropy is zero, so I mean you are very confident. Therefore, there is no uncertainty associated with it. Right? Therefore, the entropy is zero. So, in other words, you can consider this as the average minimum number of just no question that you want to ask a user. So, in other words, that let's say you covered your prediction is more than one predict uh, quite confidently that reading is wrong. A model to predict uh, less uncertain about reading three. So uncertainty in model one is smaller and therefore this entropy is smaller too. So in, in other words, what we really want, we want our model, the current model, we want to become model one because we want model one, we want our model very confident, has less uncertainty social with it. Therefore, we want the entropy as small as possible of the model that we are we gonna obtain, right? So therefore, so what I what I try to say here, in other words, is that we really want our model to become model one after we see the rate. So in other words, we kind of be the measure about using entropy and want to minimize entropy. Any question? So anyway, so let, let's look at the, the, the particular example you want to make, make it clear. So suppose, this is a very simple example. Suppose you got a, a new user. And now you have two taste types, only two, but nothing more than that. And now we have two digits. Uh, we want to say, okay, whether this user is really like thriller or this user is really like romantic. But we have no idea which category this guy belongs to. So the question is, which movie do we show the new user and best know her type? That, that's what the original question we want to ask. Right? So what we actually do is to calculate so-called conditional entropy of our prediction model. So when, when, do I, when I say conditional entropy is that, say, if I conditionally know that this new user weights this particular item as rating I, if I know that information, how can I improve my existing model? What would the model look like, or what is uncertainty of the new model looks like? And we're gonna minimize this entropy measure. So that's his idea behind it. So, in other words, transform to the mathematical formula is 
This is entropy. Conditional entropy. Conditional what? Conditional say, I know if I give this item to the user, and this user say, I like it or hate it, and then I will calculate the conditional probability of my model's belief about whether this user belongs to like thriller or like romantic. And then get this uncertainty. And we want to minimize the uncertainty. Uh, or in other words, minimize entropy. So, so in other words, so if say if the user rate lottery as five here, yeah. and we will just completely reduce entropy. So that's basically the question we're gonna ask. However, we're not really not sure what this guy is waiting gonna be, right? We, we might ask a lot of rates, but this user might say I hate it. Might, might say I like, but it might have some chance say I hate it. Do we sort of, do we, are, we still need to aim, are we still able to tackle the entry? Uh, yes, but in this case, you need to submission over all possibilities that you're gonna return, right? And then using the current model to predict how likely this user gonna uh, gonna how likely this five rating gonna happen? Uh, therefore, you averaging across this, you could get this. Um, you will get the uh, you will get a choice. So in other words, you minimize instead of even conditional, you minimize expected conditional entropy respect to uh, the rating that you are gonna give. Any question? Uh, in general, so this is an example that I come up with. In general, what you can have is that you you can deliver the model as you know sigma, whatever model it is, the user base, item base, factorized, uh, factory factorization, and you come in with a you know method to reduce uncertainty of a model and to maximize <coughs> maximize that. And another is that you could using uh, uncertainty of your prediction. So instead of uncertainty of our model, uncertainty of prediction, which is uh, what we talked about uh, previously. And the third one is that if you have a true user model, this is more Bayesian perspective, but uh, I just, um, you don't need to you know, fully understand this. It's, it's fine. But then try to sort of expand the idea is that you, if you have a true user model, what you really want is that you want something you uh, produced when you know that information to see the similarity between the would be maximized or the distance between the, the true one would be minimized. So so instead of calculate the entropy, you calculate the KR divergence, KR divergence between the, your, the model you obtain and the true model, and therefore you would come up with that. Uh, with us better. So um, again, I think there's no definitive answer as opposed to what would be the best. But the the, pr the results actually show in this paper uh, was that you have several methods, right? We have both method one, method two, method three that we talk about. Uh, it this actually shows that if you're using Bayesian approach, in fact, has a be better performance. Surprisingly, surprisingly, and uh, think about this, this is a random. Random one, in fact, uh, was the better than the, uh, the rest two approach. So that means we suggest sometimes if the try efforts is it seems that random one <coughs> already did a pretty job. Good job. Mm -hmm. But looking at the Bayesian one, it did be quite good. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, quite good in terms of select. The, the early, especially for the early uh, <coughs> uh, items, if you just try one or two, if you just try two items already uh, good than the, by average, good than the three, if you do the random. So that basically suggests that uh, if you apply this active learning approach, it, it works. Uh, <coughs> Any question about the active learning? Yeah. 
Is this something you're gonna you gonna apply in practice, perhaps to address code star problem? Uh, if, <laughs> is there an idea if it's alright? Or maybe <laughs> just try to run it. Uh, so we run try to run it. Uh, when it works, you know, the thing, right? it's the thing. Run the software. It's the water. It's the water. It'd be a lot easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> Better return on investment. Yes. <laughs> Little effort. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, for the follow, for the remaining uh, um, five minutes also, uh, we can talk about talk about the uh, progress screen. Um. Think about this. This is different with uh, with textual data, where you have a document feature, therefore you would make a random prediction. Here is that it really depends on the user behavior. It really depends on user rating. So, what if some guy say, "Okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna attack recommended system. I'm gonna create fake user rating." Try to promote my product, and uh, then in order to imp improve my uh, increase my revenue, perhaps. So again, here example. Let's say we got our original data set, and now we come in with the two fake people. The goal is that we want to promote lab actually. Like everybody gonna gonna recommend it. Uh, everybody love actually, you know, encourage them to, to watch it, even though it's probably, perhaps it's not really like that. How can we do that? Can we s sort of um, um, increase our prediction from a from a user base? Let's say this Netflix using a user base approach. So what you can do is that you can say for the for the sum of the other ratings. You can come with uh, you know whatever rating you come with. You might randomly you know have assigned ratings. Where for the target items, the one that you wanna promote, you could give the you know highest rating possible. And when you calculate the similarity, <coughs> the more fake rating you come with, the higher chance that these borrowers of the the, the, the the uh, real user, when you calculate similarity, these fake ratings might be put into their neighborhood, right? And then these ratings might immediately become very so dominant, or you know, because they have rating five, when you do the averaging, rated averaging, and then they might have influence, impact on the final prediction. So in this case, um, if you do that, you calculate this. Uh, because they are similar in this case, um, for the borrowers, in fact, this region will probably go over there. Therefore, if you remember that uh, the original rating was this borrowers doesn't like, not actually, but in this case, uh, the prediction was that the borrower is going to like. Therefore, you, you sort of promote that actually and put the movie into the recommendation list. So this is a uh, sort of uh, shading attack that you can come up with. Um, obviously, as a as the people run those recommender systems, want to detect those uh, attack profile in order to provide that for capital, right? So uh, so what you can do is you can actually identify those profile for the reading group, and then we we'll remove it. And remove it, and then you obviously would have a recovered original matrix, and you would make a better uh, prediction. So it's, this is quite similar to uh, detecting email spam. Uh, Google has this uh, well, quite quite good uh, spam detection, spam filtering in the, uh, in the email, in the Google Gmail, in Gmail. So. Um, it's also related to the credit card fraud detection. So we have some abnormal behavior to try to detect that. Um, so it's, we really want, if we want to have produce a very good detection method, we definitely need to understand the difference between this attack profile and uh, the genuine user profile. So here are some 
some analysis. If you find that for the movie that is in that set, uh, so the general user are more likely to repeat items they like. So by looking at the distribution of that, it's in terms of the frequency of the ratings that the highest amount is for. So people tend to give uh, ratings for as opposed to one or five. Um, same case for another data set called book crossing data set, which is a uh, uh, is a is a is a rating uh, people uh, collected about uh, books. So instead of uh, rating from one to five, here's a rating one to ten. So you keep in fact, we have a similar period. The higher the rating, the, the, the higher the frequency it is. Uh, so in other words, that if you say this uh, rating is missing at random, or this attack attackers coming with a strategy like um, or non-promote or non-promoting uh, ratings uh, movies are only using a random Reaching so they are going to reach all possible user profiles. If it's a come with strategy, we can easily detect that because we know that for the general user, it's those data it's not really uh, it's not really follow uh, randomness. It's not really. And also, um, so it's so the, the one missing is not really um, fully random. It's really uh, there are certain pattern over there. Uh, so. Based on that, what we can come up with is a, is a, is a measure that look at the similarity between the uh, between items in your uh, in your profile. So, if it's very likely you're gonna rate similar movies in the past, uh, we have this uh, Latin value here. Well, so uh, the general user would have low uh, measure no score, whereas the attacker would have a high score. So what I try to say is that you can come in with this on the score function and then to try to um, make, make, uh, differentiate the general user and the attackers. And uh, so another one is that because this, the one we talk about is that we never really have really considered the people who are negative ratings. So there's additional versions that improve that, but I added a little bit take into account these uh, negative ratings. By doing this, you will have a much better, uh, much better um, uh, score function. Um, so here is a measure. It's slightly different with uh, what we talk about in information. We talk about position recall. So in this case, and here is that is the ROC curve is commonly used in machine learning when we talk about detection problem or classification problem. Uh, so I think that well an interesting thing is that if you are <coughs> interesting on that, I think one thing you can think about is that it's again also a trade off between two positive grade and the false positive grade. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail here, but you can map this to position recall to see that in fact there is some correspondence between policy curve and position recall. Um, so, this is basically what happens in machine learning when we talk about the detection accuracy using the ROC curve, which is basically the curve um, here, where if you have higher uh, true positive rate and uh, higher, uh, a lower, sorry, lower false positive rate, you would basically have a better performance. So that we we actually plot the results of several approach. You can see that the, the, the two um, approach that two methods that we proposed in fact have a, a better performance. So and then they have a couple of different different strands here. It's not uh, going to go into detail here. Uh, so, so this is basically in fact it's a very simple um, in the mass statistics produced. It's quite a simple method, but it worked quite well. So they give the idea about when you do a, a thesis about information retrieval data mining, it's really about to make sense of the data, coming with a sensible solution to tackle the specific 
information retrieval and data mining program. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it is. Uh, what I gotta say, bit ahead of schedule. Uh, but if you have, do you have any questions? If you do have any questions? We'll see you next next Friday. Prince William? Hey.